So the final speaker of our first session today will be uh, Laura Tedesco. She's the Cultural Heritage Program Manager for the United States Department of State's Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. She has worked over extended periods of time in Afghanistan, and she will speak to us about what price culture, destruction, and cultural heritage preservation in Afghanistan since 2001. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, something. Um, delighted to be here, honored to be here today, and um, thank you for listening to this very brief overview of some cultural destruction in Afghanistan, and I hope that in the midst of some of the more devastating images from Afghanistan, and we'll, we've seen a lot and we'll see a lot today, there will be some images that also bring a bit of hope um, that not all is lost. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. And for those who have visited Kabul and the National Museum in Kabul, this plaque may look familiar to you. It's a very simple yet elegant statement that sits at the just at the main entrance of the National Museum of Afghanistan. And it was erected in 2002 <clears throat> when the staff of the National Museum could return after the fall of the Taliban and when the museum still had only a partial roof and most of its galleries had been destroyed through rocket attacks, mostly unintentional rocket attacks. I'm going to start quickly with a map also just to orient um, that I hope in the seven minutes that I'll speak there we'll visit some in Kabul. We'll talk about that. I want to show some work in Ghazni and some destruction there. And if there's time at the end, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about a very interesting site just south of Kabul called Messainak. So these images more or less speak for themselves in terms of what the extent of damage was to the National Museum of Afghanistan, which had been founded in the 1920s, and in its day was the finest archaeological museum in all of Central Asia. Its vast collections were all systematically excavated material from the territory of Afghanistan, mostly by French, German, British, some American, um, and Afghan archaeological expeditions. Entirely destroyed because it had the unfortunate location of being situated between two fighting factions in the Afghan Civil War. During the Afghan Civil War, the museum was also looted. Estimates were that 70% of its collection, we think around 70,000 objects, looted by Afghan Mahajideen. Um, and where those objects remain, where they went, is um, a question to be answered. We do know some, you can find some of the objects with museum numbers for sale in markets in Kabul. Difficult to recover those because much of the looting that took place are now were by individuals who now are individuals of power in the Afghan government. Just some images to <clears throat> the numismatics collection entirely looted, catalogs burned. But as an image of something optimistic, the museum was reconstructed and is in the process of being reconstructed. Um, by intrepid international workers long before, frankly, the United States became involved in any restoration work at the National Museum or the Department of State did. These, this was the good, the good results of um, other donors' work. And some before and after shots of what the spe specific galleries looked like, upper left. Same gallery now if you were to visit today on the upper right lower left and lower right. For the last four years, uh, the University of Chicago, under support from the Department of State, but for, has been doing a catalog, creating a catalog of the collections of the National Museum, because in the years of destruction and then the last 14 or decade or so of trying to sort of rehabilitate the National Museum, 
there was no existing catalog of what the actual holdings were. And while cataloging may seem somewhat of a dull and you know, not an entirely sort of sexy project to do, it however, as we know as museum professionals and archeologists, it really does create the core, the backbone of any operational museum. So the, a team from the University of Chicago has been working side by side with the young staff of the National Museum to create a bilingual, what we call dual lingual catalog between Dari, the national language, and English, so that the Afghan staff, whose English skills may not be quite fluent, can enter data about an object in Dari, and it is immediately translated into English through a very standardized catalog system with vocabulary that's already been put in. So, you know, a, a ceramic pot can be described consistently with the exact same vocabulary, for example. Store, oh, let me go back. I also would like to say that the condition of the National Museum, it's difficult to describe, but um, it will maybe be familiar to many of you. There's no climate control. The, the plumbing leaks in the storerooms. Um, there's vermin. There's security as a padlock on the door with some drowsy guys with AK-47s. It's um, not ideal. And the storerooms in particular were in very bad condition. And it's not stated as a criticism, as in that is just simply how it was. And in the aftermath of the Taliban, and I didn't even really get into what the Taliban did to the collections in the National Museum for those final months that they were in power in 2001. Um, when the staff were able to return in early 2002 to the National Museum, it was literally sweeping up damaged, destroyed objects and putting them in boxes and just putting them away. So over the years, some of that was rehabilitated, but part of what um, the University of Chicago uh, under the State Department has been doing there is to do archival rehousing of everything while cataloging. This is an image we saw earlier in one of the presentations very briefly, and it's one that will be most familiar to all of us, um, perhaps as a kind of iconic and devastating glimpse of the power of cultural destruction. What I would like to talk about, and much less well known than the destruction of the Buddhas in Bamiyan, was um, the <clears throat> complete destruction of a very important yet small provincial museum in Afghanistan in the city of Ghazni, which in its day was a major Kushan or Buddhist settlement, part of the Great Silk Road. Following that was the Islamic capital of the Ghaznavid Empire, which stretched all the way from Iran, Caspian Sea, across to India and responsible for the spread of Islam in the 11th century. And had been excavated extensively by the Italians, mostly in the 50s through the 70s, and a little bit in more recent day. A museum there with a very important collection of pre-Islamic and Islamic art, which sits in sort of the center of the capital of Ghazni province, which has the same name, Ghazni, the city. And that museum also happens to be co-located with the public library, the governor's compound, and an internet cafe which were all the target of an, an enormous car explosion. The museum itself was not the single target, but it was destroyed. And in its state of destruction now, since 2014, is how it looks today. The area is so um, kinetic, as we say, or dangerous with Taliban that even the Afghan museum staff aren't safe to go to try to sort of recoup the damage. I'm going to um, very quickly talk about a new project that um, I'm involved in, which is tracking looting of archaeological sites across Afghanistan. Estimates are that well over 90% of archaeological sites have already been looted. And the network of illicit excavation and the traffic of antiquities is a very sophisticated operation in Afghanistan. These are not sort of simply on the level of poor and illiterate farmers digging. It is, it is structured through a very hierarchical 
and powerful, with a powerful base of influential Afghans who are encouraging this. And often what we do know about it is that not in every case, but often these, this traffic, illegal traffic of antiquities is financing private militias and other nefarious activities. <clears throat> This is also going to be a project, well, it actually just started a few months ago, again through the University of Chicago, where they're taking satellite imagery. We also have, this is 2001, the image on the right. We have images also that we're using from, that were captured just in the last couple of years. Why this is also useful is new archeological sites are being discovered. Um, so that's beneficial. Um, and the hope is that this information that's gathered can then be provided to the Afghan government, who does have a police force of about 25 to monitor archaeological sites across the entire country of Afghanistan. So obviously 25 police are not going to be adequate for that, but it's a step. And I think I may be out of time, is that right? Okay, so. I'm going to leave you with this very tantalizing image of um, a massive archaeological site just south of Kabul that happens to be co-located with the world's second largest copper deposit. And that copper mining will begin. No one knows for sure uh, when, and, and the reason no one knows for sure is it's a staggeringly complex arrangement of a Chinese copper mining company, bad security, a corrupt Afghan government trying to make it all work. In the meantime, archaeologists since 2009 have been excavating what is one of the largest Kushan era sort of monastic complexes that was extracting and processing copper on an industrial level between the second to the eighth centuries AD, probably before. That's a different story for us archaeologists to get all geeked out on that. But um, the work goes on some examples of the objects, and also to what end. Um, these materials, rather in a sort of bold statement of taking entirely Buddhist artifacts for display in the National Museum in Kabul and advertising it and inviting school groups to come to see this with the idea of let's talk about, let's demonstrate a time and the evidence of when Afghanistan was a bit more inclusive um, in its historical views. Um, and I'll simply close again with this simple and elegant plaque outside the National Museum, which I hope all of you will see one day. That's all.